So uh, uh, one thing that I've always like struggled with uh, is, you know, there's like a, a Louis Giglio thing about the uh, how big the universe is, yeah. and I thought you did a great job of like capturing that. Uh huh. Uh, that's actually like one, been one of the main things that I've struggled with in my faith. <gasps> uh, as far as like where doubt comes in, like the small stuff, like the little cellular stuff, uh, that helps me. Like, yeah, dude, God's real. All we are is dust in the wind, dude. But uh, the big stuff, it really challenges me. Why? And uh, Why does it challenge you? I haven't figured it out yet. Excellent! <laughs> but last. Um, <laughs> maybe you can help me. One thing that I thought about um, whenever you were talking about how it, precise it has to be, uh -huh. like this little tiny zone of life. Right. we're in around our sun and our right. sun's like tiny compared to the big sun right. so you've got what is it uh beetlejuice that, sure. that big old sun mm -hmm. it's so much bigger than our little tiny sun mm -hmm. so i feel like that zone of life that's in orbit around that sun is probably like so much bigger than ours so a planet our size could fit in that and have lots of room to live well my bodacious dude smaller stars like our own live longer than larger stars quote the length of a star's life depends on how fast it uses up its nuclear fuel. Our sun, in many ways an average sort of star, has been around for nearly 5 billion years and has enough fuel to keep going for another 5 billion years. And, quote, heavier stars thus burn their fuel much faster than less massive ones do and are disproportionately brighter. Some will exhaust their available hydrogen within a few million years, end quote. So, even if a supermassive star had a bigger Goldilocks zone, it won't last long enough for life to evolve on a planet orbiting that star. Our Earth is a little over 4.5 billion years old. About 3.8 billion years ago, the history of life on our planet began with single-celled organisms like bacteria. It took over a billion years for multicellular life to evolve. Human beings have only been around about 200,000 of those years. If Earth had been orbiting a star that only lasted a few million years, life wouldn't have had the time required to evolve, let alone evolve complex multicellular life, before its parent star had exhausted its fuel. It also turns out the smaller stars, called red dwarfs, outnumber stars the size of our own sun, and they tend to have more planets orbiting them. If you're looking for life, it would seem smaller stars are where you want to be focusing your attention. Uh based off of just the sheer size of it, it everything would well, have to be Well, but according, there's not just one habitable zone, there's actually nine habitable zones. And they all have to overlap. Uh, no. <laughs> there's just one habitable zone. From NASA, quote, The habitable zone is the distance from a star where one can have liquid water on the surface of a planet. If a planet is too close to its parent star, it will be too hot and water would have evaporated. If a planet is too far from a star, it is too cold and water is frozen. End quote. It would seem that NASA doesn't acknowledge your nine habitable zones, Frank. However, some scientists are starting to make noises about changing the definition of what is and isn't a habitable zone. Many of the planets that are further away from their parent star can still have water, although much of it is frozen, and beneath the frozen crust it's possible that life might exist. It's also true that we tend to look for other things besides whether or not a planet sits within a Goldilocks zone, such as whether the planet has a viable atmosphere. Small changes, such as the difference between the composition of our crust and a planet like Mars's, can mean the difference between a planet teeming with life and a seemingly dead red planet, even though both technically sit within the habitable zones of our sun. So you've got an ultraviolet uh, habitable zone. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, there's a very small window in which you, you can fit a planet that could have life on it as we know it. And most scientists are saying that we have a rare earth. In fact, there's a book called Rare Earth that is highly improbable, despite the size of the universe, that there's any other planet with exactly the kind of parameters we have to have the kind of life that we know about. 
it's possible that we are a rare planet. It might also be the case that life is actually abundant throughout the universe. We have a space and time problem. Some civilizations could grow and die before their signals reached us. For example, the radio signals we've been sending for about 80 years have only had time to travel a maximum of 0.001% of the galaxy. Even if our signals were to reach a future civilization, it's likely we will have died out as a species long before then. Awesome. So, oh, yeah. let me mention one other thing. I know some people think, well, you, you hear the, you hear, well, if God exists, there's a lot of wasted space out there, right? A couple of responses to that. You don't waste anything if you're God because you have infinite resources, so nothing's wasted. Right, but why bother creating a universe the size of ours if the most important aspect of that universe, us, is microscopic in size? One of the things that really bothers me about a lot of religions is that they arrogantly assert that we're more important than we are. That's not to say that I don't think we are valuable. I do. I think it's a beautiful sentiment that we are a part of the universe and as such our consciousness is like the universe becoming aware of itself. But to pretend that billions of stars and planets were made by a god that cares deeply about each and every one of us is just pure fantasy. All the evidence points towards a universe that is indifferent to us, which is why it's important that we care for each other. Most of the universe is hostile to human life. There's no magic entity out there ready to save us if we screw up. Secondly, the majesty of the universe cries out to, to, to God's nature, or actually brings forth in our minds, the awesomeness of God's nature. Why would a God that is all-powerful and that supposedly values our worship and belief in its existence rely on second-rate evidence? You just admitted that this being can't be wasteful because it has infinite resources. So why not produce something that will convince each and every one of us? This being would know exactly what would convince me, and it could produce it without cost to itself. It would take no effort whatsoever. It could beam knowledge into my head instead of relying on primitive books, or the charlatans that pretend to know what this being would want of us. We wouldn't need Frank Turek to explain the motivations of this being, because we would all know, we would all understand what this being required of us. By the way, we use the word awesome too much. We say, hey, awesome shirt, dude, awesome shot, dude. No, the only thing that's awesome is God. Not really, Frank. Learn to English. <laughs> Even the examples in the dictionary don't mention a God. And, I mean, imagine if the, if the, if the universe stopped at the cloud tops. We'd look up and go, this is no big deal. But when you look up and you see stars equivalent to grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth, and to go from one star to another star going five miles a second will take you over 200,000 years, you get an idea of what infinity is, right? Again, a god of infinite power could give us an idea of what infinity is without using second-rate evidence. It could beam that knowledge into our heads. As it stands, numbers start to lose meaning once you start talking about truly huge numbers. If someone tells me I'll be tortured for 50 years, I can understand what that will mean. If someone says you'll be tortured for 100 billion years, I can't quite wrap my mind around what it would be like to be tortured for 100 billion years. Sure, I know it's a long time, but the concept is lost on me somewhat. When people talk about infinity, like when they say they're going to live forever, I don't think they truly grasp what it would be like to actually live forever. Imagine thousands, millions, or billions of years doing the same old things. I think you'd quickly become bored. Life would become tedious. I think we'd all like to live a little longer than we currently do, but I don't think we'd actually want to live for eternity if it were being forced on us. Also, I think when atheists say there's a lot of wasted space out there, even if they're right about it, let's say there's wasted space and there's no life out there. Let's suppose you're walking through the desert, miles and miles of desert, and you find an iPhone just sitting there. You could say, well, there's a lot of wasted space around this iPhone, but you'd still have to explain why the iPhone's there, right? The iPhone is a manufactured piece of equipment. It isn't a life form. Second, deserts aren't wasted space. They might not be teeming with iPhones, but they are full of life. Third, atheists don't have to explain where life came from. We can just say we don't know, but we will continue to investigate. Maybe we'll figure it out, and maybe we won't. Just because you have a primitive, made-up fantasy tale that asserts to know the answer doesn't mean it's a plausible one or that we should take it seriously. In other words, the atheists are concentrating on the wrong thing. They're concentrating on the area where there's no life, but they still have to explain why there's life where it is. Why is there a life where it is? Even if there are miles and miles of nothing but sand, they still have to explain why that iPhone is there. Some intelligent being put it there. Make sense? No, Frank. Many of us are concentrating on the truth. We don't jump to conclusions because our superstitious, ignorant ancestors thought a magic being that sits outside of space and time did the things they couldn't understand at the time. 
Anyhow, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Take care and cheers. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, you thought that was the end of the video. Silly you. I just wanted to share this little tidbit with you. About a month ago, I made this video response to David the Irishman Helton. The title still makes me laugh. On Saturday, he dropped a link in the comment section of that video. I was curious, clicked it, and was delighted to find the angriest response video I have ever received. Anyhow, I thought I'd share it with you. Roll it. Hello. So I'm the guy who made the uh, lighter hairbrush proves God video. Uh, not my greatest of moments. And uh, it's pretty intoxicated. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. There, is that better? I, I turned it. It's just a phone. It's not on a stand. I'm actually holding it with, you know, my God hand. Um. Yay. <laughs> now we can watch you sideways. You managed to find a way to make vertical video even more annoying. So, Godless Cranium. Yeah, it's, it's so it's my turn now. So, I'm assuming that, uh, and I am assuming, I don't know, but I'm assuming that this is what you do for a living. You hijack other people's videos and then you make mad fun of them. No, I actually work with the deaf blind full time. This is my hobby. But yes, I do like making response videos, although a quick look at my past videos will show you that response videos aren't all I enjoy doing. Even though you say you're trying to disprove them, really what it looks like is you're just, you're a big fucking bully, is what it looks like. So I'm assuming that you were either somebody who, who has no fucking friends, um, you're probably not, you know... You're probably too fat to actually have a fucking job. I'm assuming you're fat piece of shit who sits on their fucking computer all goddamn day. And, you know, does what you do. Uh, where people like me actually go out and help build the country. You know, and, uh, you know, actually have purpose. Um, other than, you know, talking shit about people. And... As far as the hairbrush goes, I understand that, that that's actually a child's hairbrush and I understand that you probably don't know what that is because you probably don't have kids. You've probably honestly never even gotten fucking laid. Um, but that's cool. Because um, I get I get plenty of pussy because I'm fucking married. Um, and I have a job. And, uh, you know. So... Hmm. Trying to think of more stuff to add to this. But I'm drawing a blank because after reading this like 600 some odd comments, I just, you have so many followers that are just as fucking ignorant, ignorant and stupid as you are that it, it's just really hard. There's so many things going through my head right now. and I, I mean, do you even know how to change your own fucking oil in your vehicle? Do you have a vehicle? Or do you ride your fucking bicycle to work? Oh wait, that's right, you don't go to fucking work, what was I thinking? You don't need a vehicle because you sit at home on your fucking computer looking at a screen. Isolating in your sad, depressed little world. Um. Man. The difference between me and you is if we were face to face right now, you would be trying to explain why I'm wrong. But in the middle of you explaining, I would probably just punch you in your fucking throat and beat your fucking ass. But hey, whatever works. Um, I bet you by the end of it, you'd probably be believing and wishing God was real. Anyways, that's all I got to say. Oh, here. Uh, see, I like that better. I mean, to each their own, I suppose.